when I was growing up, I had a uh, paper route. Paper route, starting eighth grade all the way through through the end of senior year. It was a little, it's a little brutal. It would rain a lot. Uh, a couple of those years were actually really wet winters, and I would I would have to have um, poly bags, uh, those plastic bags that you put newspapers in, uh, so they don't get wet. I'd put the poly bags over my uh, socks, and then I'd put rubber bands at the top, like halfway up my halfway up my calf, and then I put rain slicks over that, and just it was a train wreck. <laughs> I go out and it would just be pouring, pouring rain, and I, you know, jump into the rain and throw the papers. I had like sixty-five and get after it. And when I started doing the paper route, I thought it would be really smart of me to to take a little extra time and make an Excel spreadsheet because I was like, hey, I'm a businessman now. This is my shtick. And the interesting thing with with paper routes then, and I presume now, is that you're actually a private contractor. Okay, so what's happening is you're not you're not necessarily getting paid directly from the newspaper. What you're doing is you're you have these contracts with your customers and they could the, they could pay you or they could pay the newspaper directly. And so say I owed like a thousand dollars a month for all of the newspapers or something like that. If if the majority of people paid and they paid a thousand and ten dollars, the newspaper would cut me a check for ten bucks. But if, say, only 50% of the newspapers, uh, 50% of my customers paid the newspaper directly, what would happen is that I would have to come up with that last bit of money and they'd send me these little receipts that I would use to then go go to the individual house and say, hey, you owe me, you owe me this money. And they'd say, oh, okay. Now, again, at the beginning, I liked the idea of being this businessman. So I'd, you know, collect my, my little receipts that I would then take, my vouchers, essentially. I'd take to the houses and say, hey, you guys owe me this money, just you know, pay me my money. And man, it was a pain. Some people would dodge me. There's that classic American film where the newspaper boy is like, I want my $2. And it was like that, as painful as that sounds. It actually was very much a, you know, I want my $2 kind of shtick. So there I was. I had my paper route. I was a businessman. whoop dee dee for me. And I hated it. I hated that aspect of it, doing the doing the thing that I thought was appropriate, which was, you know, having the spreadsheet and keeping track of the people who paid and didn't pay and all the stuff. It was kind of a mess. But that was kind of my first introduction into into business. And then as I got older, I went through Cal and I started tutoring. And then in my senior year, right at the end, I realized, you know, I really like tutoring and there might be an avenue for me to, to tutor privately. And the SAT was actually going through this massive overhaul in 2004. And I thought, oh, you know, here's an opportunity. The SAT is changing. And wherever I knew wherever there was flux or chaos or shifts, there were opportunities. I didn't know what those opportunities were. And I had it in my head that I had this grand opportunity because the other tutoring companies were ill-equipped to deal with this change and all of this stuff. Totally not true. Everybody knew it was changing. Everybody knew it was going to be on the test. It was not a big deal. But I thought there was an opportunity there. So when I go and I talk to the head of the tutoring center and I tell him, I'm like, hey, guess what? His name was Tony. I was like, Tony, the SAT is changing. I think you can tutor for the SAT privately. And he had told me in in years past, he was like, there's no money in private tutoring because you just can't find the clients. And I said, hey, I think I think there's an opportunity here. So I started talking to him and he got really excited. He was like, yeah, I think that's a great idea. He was like, look, we got to come up with a company name. We got to come up with an LLC. And he, he got out a notepad and started writing this stuff down and, you know, come up with, with a location because that aud- adds, you know, authenticity to, to the company, all the stuff. So he was like, he's talking about getting, signing a lease for some real estate somewhere, all of these things. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Of course, nothing ever came from that conversation. But I did start tutoring privately, and then shortly thereafter, I did start tutoring for the SAT. It had nothing to do with, with you know, getting a location or, or having Tony's, you know, PhD, the weight of his education behind us and his career as a, as a tutor, tutor center manager. But the first tutoring client I had, I really, I really liked working with them. They really enjoyed me, and I, they'd invite me to their house for dinner. I was a young guy; I was like 22, 23, and they were incredibly successful real estate people. Incredibly, I mean, they came. the The husband had come from Taiwan with nothing, 
absolutely nothing. And the the wife had grown up not with a ton, um, kind of in the I believe Sacramento area, and then came out came out to Berkeley and they crushed. They were worth tens and tens of millions of dollars. They just worked like animals. So they were savage, savage business people. They understood uh, Berkeley property law. They understood um, the, the nuances of running a very successful real estate broker. This woman had been a real estate broker since she was 23. It was amazing. And I got a little tour of their house once. And they, had, they lived in a beautiful house. It wasn't crazy, but it was a, it was a house kind of nestled up in the hills. And I remember going through the office, and this was the office, this is where business was done, right? And I distinctly remember seeing like pack after pack of legal pads, and they were like three by five or four by six, there were the smaller ones. There were some larger ones too, but just tons of these little four by six legal pads, little yellow legal pads right next to a phone. And I looked at that. and. It obviously stuck with me because at the height of, of their real estate endeavors, the wife was selling, she was closing on a house a week in, in Berkeley, on the phone constantly, crushing. Okay, she was a she she worked in a brokerage and so did her sister, but that was it. They were they were machines. And the husband managed, I think, 60 plus properties, all properties they had purchased and, and he'd rehabilitated and gone on from. But I mean, at, so at some points he had multiple properties with like 20 plus units in them. So here's a one man venture on the management side and then a one person venture on the, the brokerage side where the wife was selling these houses and, and the husband was picking them up. They did not have amazing Excel spreadsheets that were so sparkly and cool. In all of the time I worked with them and I knew them, there was nothing shiny and sparkly about their business. And the husband who managed all of these properties and, and dealt with all of these tenants, he had a phone and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of paper to write down stuff and get after it. He didn't have some fancy office. He didn't have some, you know, condo next to an awesome coffee shop, you know, property management, LLC, blah, blah, blah. He had a legal pad. He had a legal pad and a lot of pencils. And it has really stuck with me. And thinking about it in, in more recent years, the interesting thing about that is that you have most people have an idea of how business is supposed to go okay i know i did right when i was a young young kid with paper out and then when i was in college talking to tony about starting a tutoring company we had some idea of what this experience was supposed to be what it was supposed to be like to to have a business to be a business person and be successful and you see a lot of people with that, especially small business owners. They're like, oh, the, I have to have just the right uniforms or I have to have just the right spot and I have to have just the right window you know, decorations, all of these various things. And I'm not saying those things hurt. Don't be wrong. That's not where I'm coming from. But at the core of it, at the very core of it, if you do not recognize that you're in the business of getting to work, you're never, ever going to make it. The, the, two, the couple that I'm talking about, those two people, they were not flashy or beautiful or dressed in amazing clothes. They wore jeans and a sweater, man. And they worked. They knew exactly what their role was. They knew exactly what the purpose was of their day in those moments. And... And that really was the first time I saw real business. I kind of knew it then, and I sure as hell know it now. Those people, that couple, which I very much admire, they knew what they were there to do. They were there to get to work. Their business was work. And they, they took care of it as simply and effectively as possible. There were no mistakes. There was no confusion. They just did exactly what it was. And I see this with my students a lot. 
I see it with my students a lot. They they talk about planning different, you know, like internships or they're planning little, you know, companies or ventures and, and God bless them. That's awesome that they're doing that. But every single time, every single time I come back to it and just say, look, that's all well and fine. But when are you going to get to work? And if the answer is not right now, this second, I give them a hard time. Because at the core of it, no matter what you do, business or otherwise, if you are not getting to work at the core purpose of your existence, what are you doing other than wasting time? I'm Matt Todd, and this is the engine that drives me. Go out and crush it.